All right, since I introduced myself earlier, I'm not going to go into my credentials other than to remind you that I have been in research for most of my career, including 19 years at the Upjohn Company, a pharmaceutical firm, which of course gets a lot of bad press these days. Part of what I'm going to talk about, though, is um, an extension of what John Mackey talked about, and also why what has made the pharmaceutical companies the way they are? You, you probably won't be surprised to find that it's a lot of regulation. And also, of course, naturally, I want to, the, the important part is to tell you how this impacts on you and how you can work around what, what has happened in both the pharmaceutical industry and in other areas. So I'm going to get started by talking, and this is really, a horrible topic to talk about when you're having lunch, but I'm going to talk about caloric restriction. <laughs> and the reason I'm going to start here is because I want to uh, just kind of build on what John Mackey said. One of the things that all the anti-aging experts agree on is that if you eat less, you live more. Basically, you live longer. Assuming, of course, you have a nutrient-dense diet. And John Mackey talked a little bit about what that meant. Now, what does this mean for humans? Uh, if you cut back to about 80% of the calories you prefer, you can really start seeing benefits. What are these benefits? Well, better health, longevity, less cancer, less heart disease, all the usual things. And you can actually look at the products that your genes make and compare before and after caloric restriction you can see a whole new set of genes getting turned on and bad ones getting turned off when you restrict your calories. Now I should also mention that because of course as humans we don't want to restrict our calories. We are built genetically to eat and we do that because in starvation times it's a good idea to have some fat on you. So we're genetically programmed to go ahead and eat as much as we can when we can get our hands on food. So it's nothing to be ashamed of, it's the way we're built. But um, because of this, there are some places where they are looking at different drugs or nutrients that change the gene profile in the same way that caloric restriction does. Now that hasn't come to total fruition yet, but I'll just mention that resveratrol, which is the compound in red grapes, um, and red wine, I'm sorry, that's uh, a great product, obviously, that uh, has a, a pattern of turning on some of the same genes, and metformin, which is an anti-diabetic drug, does the same thing. Now, obviously, this is, is developed enough that I would want to say, well, take those instead, but it's not a bad start, especially the resveratrol, since it's a natural product. Now, there are people who try to restrict, but the point I really want to make is that when you have the Whole Foods diet that John Mackey just described, you end up eating fewer calories because of all the fiber. He sort of alluded to that, but he didn't really make the strong statement. But if you noticed his slide in the Okinawans, they ate about 1785, 1785 calories on average, whereas the average American is eating 2,500. So they're calorically restricted. And that may be part of the benefit of that diet. And I'll, I think as I continue my talk, you'll see why I think that. Now, there are groups of people who are actually trying to limit their calories in much the same way. Um, and the bottom, the bottom URL, Living the CR Way, is actually a community that I've just started uh, working with. And they, they really basically restrict in a very severe way. And the CR Society, which is the URL above that, is actually a group of people who keep on top of the literature in this area. 
So that's a kind of a fun site to visit too if you're interested in this. Now how these groups limit their calories can be very different. One of the biggest ways that people limit their calories is through fasting. Because it turns out if you fast one day and eat what you want the other, you will naturally restrict your calories. And there's many types of fasting. I'm not going to really go into that other than just to just bring it to your attention. So if you feel like, oh, I don't think I can, you know, I don't think I can every day keep my calories low, another option is to have a day where you don't eat much or anything. Uh, and then have days when you can have pretty much what you want. Now, I need to talk about caloric restriction before I talk about this point, which is that you need to keep your blood glucose low. One of the things that the kind of diet that John Mackey describes uh, does is it keeps your glucose low because when you eat all those carbs, you're calorically restricted. If you weren't calorically restricted and you ate 87% of your diet in sweet potatoes like the Okinawans did, you almost certainly would have a big increase in glucose, blood glucose. And that's bad because if you increase your blood glucose too high, you will develop type 2 diabetes. In fact, that's, the, that's how it's developed. You keep your blood glucose high, you end up with insulin resistance, and that's the definition of type 2 diabetes. So you don't want to have your glucose high. So what do you do? Well, one of the best things to do is to get a glucose meter. And again, John Mackey showed a picture of that. You can pick them up at Walmart for about, I think, $39. And you can pick up the strips. The bad news is you have to stick your finger. Oh, I hate that. But I have to tell you, it's very instructive. When I tried this, what I found out is that after that my peak glucose after eating a meal, because your blood sugar rises after eating a meal, it was at about two hours. So then when I ate meals that were repetitive, I could see, okay, what's my blood glucose after two hours? Does this, does this meal raise my blood glucose more than 30 points, or doesn't it? And that was very instructive, because a lot of foods that I thought were good for me <laughs> turned out to raise my blood glucose way more than I wanted. And if you're among the two-thirds of the U.S. population that is carbohydrate sensitive, as I am, it's tough. You know, you can't eat sweet potatoes and regular potatoes and grains if you're eating the normal number of calories without having your blood sugar go up. So you have to be very careful about that. So if you don't restrict, you have to be very careful about what you eat. Now, protein, when you eat it, does counteract the rise in blood glucose because it puts out a hormone called glucagon which opposes the, um, opposes the action of insulin. So it kind of helps you control your glucose level. But as John Mackey explains, you don't want to eat too much protein or you have other bad effects. Another little twist in this is it depends on how old you are. Because some of these studies he cited, which I actually went and read a few of them, they found that, for example, people over 65 did better if they ate more protein, not less. And that's because as you get older, usually your digestion isn't quite as good. And so what you end up doing if you don't eat enough protein is you end up having just the carbs being absorbed. Your blood glucose comes up and you don't have that opposing protein. So, some of the elderly people actually did much better eating a little more protein. If you're getting the feeling that this is complicated, it is. That's why I recommend you get a glucose meter and find out what works for you. Another thing you could do is you could measure the blood levels of things like cholesterol and other, uh, other uh, parameters in your blood. We're going to talk about how to get those cheaply in a minute. But I want, to, I want to alert you to the fact that every one of us is different. And if you want to be healthy, you really have to be proactive in understanding how your body reacts to these things and what you can do. And if you're really determined to have good health, and you're really determined to uh, lose weight and just you know be the best you can be, then you really need to look into the caloric restriction URLs that I put on the earlier slide. 
Okay, so one of the things that I like, um, I know that uh, I know that John Mackey isn't too keen on it, is the zone diet. And that's because it's not really a low carb diet. Of course, it depends on your, you know, what you consider low. It's the original 40, 30, 30 diet. But that's not why I like it. I like it because of the science behind it. You see, what, what Barry Sears, the person who you know, designed the zone diet is that he was trying to get rid of silent inflammation, which we talk about a lot today. And this was 20 years ago, so this is way before anyone else was thinking about this. And basically, this diet works whether you're a vegetarian or a meat eater. And it has 40% of your calories and carbs, which is a lot lower than, say, the 87% that your Okinawans have and 30% of your calories in fats, 30% um, in carbs, 40, I'm sorry, 40% in carbs, 30% in fats, and 30% protein. But you adjust it on an individual basis depending on how your blood glucose responds to these meals. Now, you might say, well, how does it, how does it reduce inflammation? Well, in our bodies, we have systems that control, for example, our blood pressure. And part of the control is in opposing hormones. We call them mycosinoids or prostaglandins. So you have prostaglandins that raise your blood pressure, some that lower it. What you want is a balance so that you have the right blood pressure. And unfortunately today, because we eat so many what we call omega-6 oils, corn oil, soybean oil, things of that nature, um, the balance is upset because this pathway is affected by the type of oils. Omega-3 oils, which are like fish oils, change that balance. They bring it back into balance, so to speak. So a lot of people are taking fish oil today to bring that balance back. Of course, again, fish oil is an oil, so it's, it's high caloric. So that has to figure in to your entire diet plan, which means you can eat less fats in general. Um, one of the reasons um, the eating a lot of vegetables works really well is because they're rich in polyphenols, which also influence the inflammation pathway. So that's another good thing to be aware of. Now, like some of the other diets, the zone diet reverses type 2 diabetes. And actually, recently, about three years ago, Barry Sears published a paper showing that the fish oil that he sells, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, actually reversed AMD, age-related macular degeneration. Nothing else has been shown to do that, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and the reason he used his fish oil is because he actually hired one of the world famous chemists from Britain to make sure his fish oil was pure. If you take fish oil, it is very important that you take a very high grade of fish oil because most of it is contaminated with PCBs, which of course can do you a lot of harm, or it's oxidized, kind of like, um, I guess the analogy would be when you see rust on iron, that's bad. You don't want that happening to your fish oil <laughs> because that's not going to be good for you, right? So it's important to get a high-grade fish oil. And the only fish oil I like is the one that comes from Dr. Sears or the Life Extension Foundation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Of course, you can have whatever fish oil you want, but I just want to remind you that um, the Sears fish oil is actually has one-fifth of the PCBs that prescription fish oil does. So that gives you an idea of how pure it is. And, and again, my belief is that a lot of the negative studies with fish oil have been because they use fish oil that's contaminated with PCBs or highly oxidized. So you want to be careful when you take that, if you take it. Now, Barry Sears also has a number of products uh, that would not be considered whole foods. I'll tell you right up front. You know, it's things like zone pasta, snack bars, cereal, and what these are is he's managed to uh, construct a flour that releases carbs very slowly. Now, why is this important? 
Well, if it releases the carbs very slowly, then even if you're sensitive to carbs, you can probably eat these on the pasta. And I can tell you, it tastes really good. <laughs> now, my sister's a diabetic. She has trouble um, being in a place where she's not hungry. So what she has been doing is eating a little bit of zone pasta twice a day between meals, and it's enabled her to lose over 60 pounds. That's pretty impressive. So even though it's not a whole food, if you feel like you need something, it's not quite working, you might want to try something like this and see if it works for you. I'm a big believer in trying what works for you. And everyone's different, so maybe that will help and of course, uh, I talked already about the reversing inflammation, so I won't go into that more. What I will say is that this kind of information isn't put out there very much. I, you heard John Mackey say that you know people just don't want to talk about that and accept it. And part of the reason, I believe, in addition to what he said, was that our government has promoted their food pyramid for so long, their high carbohydrate food pyramid. And by high carbs, I don't mean the kind of carbs that John Mackey's talking, vegetables. I'm talking about the bread, pasta, sugar, this kind of carb. They promoted that for so long, I think people uh, you know, feel the government knows best. As we know, that is not the case, at least not all the time, most of the time, maybe any of the time. So uh, that's not something that people always want to hear. But as a research scientist, I'm going to tell you that in the 60s, when I was beginning to get excited about going into science research, uh, we were really on the verge of a golden age of health. Like John Mackey said, we, the antibiotics, sanitation, and other advances had eradicated the number one killer of the early 20th century, which was infection. We didn't have much infection in the 60s. Um, we, we had controlled it. And vitamins had been discovered not only discovered, but we had learned how to make them in large quantities, which was important back then because you couldn't get fresh fruits and vegetables all year round. I remember going to the supermarket with my mother, and we had a choice between, we're in Michigan, we had a choice in the winter between apples, potatoes, carrots, and onions. And that was pretty much it. Today, you can get almost anything at any time, but that was not the case back in the 60s. And of course, we were getting quite a few new pharmaceutical drugs every year. And then something happened. Oops. I'm missing a slide. OK. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is right. So anyhow, I, I, one thing I didn't mention, and that's why I didn't recognize the slide. So the vitamins were not only being synthesized in large quantities. It was the pharmaceutical companies that were doing it because they knew how to do it. And they were the first ones that really put out vitamins. And this is the Unicat bottle. Uh, I think it's from the 40s, from the Upgen company, where I ended up working in the 70s. So this was, this is again, most people who are into nutrition and supplements don't realize that the pharmaceutical companies were quite on top of the whole vitamin and supplement uh, industry. But things changed. And that's what I want to talk to you about, because it's important to know. The Kiefhofer harris Amendments <coughs> happened because of the thalidomide incident that I think many of you probably remember. I was, I was a, let's see, I was, well, I'm dating myself, but I was just going into my teen years when that happened. And I remember Life magazine and the pictures of these thalidomide children who had missing limbs. They were mostly from Europe because this drug was approved in Europe, it was distributed in Europe, it was supposed to be a better sleeping aid, and it was, it was better than barbiturates. But pregnant women started taking it for morning sickness, and it did not help the babies. It created a situation where they lost, you know, the ability to create limbs, and some of them died. So in Europe there were about 10,000 malformations, and these laws were passed that gave the FDA almost unlimited power over the pharmaceutical industry. Now, as a result of all these changes, 
the pharmaceutical industry was reshaped. And one of the reasons was that now, instead of just having the pharmaceutical company send the FDA all their information, having, having the FDA look at it, and if they didn't object in a certain time period, they could market the drug. Now an FDA examiner had to sign on the dotted line for approval. That meant they put their neck in a noose, right? Because every drug has side effects. So if those side effects come to the attention of the public, well, that FDA examiner is in a bad position. So as a consequence, they kept, oops, okay, so we've got a little bit of a blip here. I'm gonna have to go back to that. So as a consequence, as you could see, prior to the passage of these amendments, the the number of years it took to get a drug from the lab bench to the market was about four. Then, once the amendments were passed, every year the FDA added more and more expectations and studies onto what the pharmaceutical companies had to do. And that means that the timeline increased. It went from about four to 14 years. So, 10 years extra to get new drugs to market. You know, some people can't wait that long. When we were developing drugs for AIDS, the AIDS patients knew they couldn't wait. So what they did is I hired black market chemists to make the very drugs we were working with in the pharmaceutical companies, and they distributed them among all of their communities. So by the time we were given permission by the FDA to do studies, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted them was either resistant or, you know, just didn't want to take them. So we had to wait for new diagnoses, new diagnosed patients to come forward to do our studies. And if you watch the award-winning movie, the Dallas Buyers Club, you saw that sometimes the FDA went after these buyers clubs. Not always. Not the ones in California that could get publicity. But here in Texas, uh, you know, they weren't so mean. Well, if you wait 10 extra years for a life-saving drug, people die. And you can actually calculate how many people die because we know how many people the average drug saves. And you don't have to go through the math, just look at the bottom here. The 4.7 million that lost their lives due to these amendment-driven delays from 63 to 99. And I only went that far because that's what we have data for. So, what do we do so that we don't have this problem? Well, unfortunately, this problem grows because if you have 14, I mean, if you have 10 extra years add on to your development time, the cost increases. And as you see, even though the timeline flattened out, the development time kind of flattened out at 14 years, the price continues to go up. The cost of, of getting a drug approved goes up. So it's, you know, um, in 2013 dollars, it was about, 1.4 billion before it was capitalized. So this is actual out-of-pocket costs. Now, if you're actually doing that much to get your drug to market, does that influence the price of the drug at the market? And the answer is, of course it does. And you can see, you don't need to be a mathematical genius. You can see that the greater the R&D, the research and development costs of getting what we call an NCE, or new drug to market, as it increases, so does the prescription drug expenditures that you pay at the, at the pharmacy. So there's a direct correlation between all of that, and if we didn't have these, we might expect that the pre-amendment uh, trends, if they had continued, we only be paying about 15%, maybe 10% what they are today. So this is really, uh, really a result of regulation. High prices, deaths due to delays, and also, um, uh, I was going to put this in another place, 
let's talk about innovation first. Um, there's problems with loss of innovation. For example, um, I got, well, I, I, could, I, I could explain that I actually got a call from the FDA one day. And they asked me, you know, they said, look, we're, we're excited because we heard you have applied for a patent across glands and liver disease. And I said, yes, that's true. They said, ah, oh, we are so happy. There's nothing for liver disease. We want to help you get this drug to market. So I'm going, oh, this is great, you know. The FDA is going to help us for a change. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. <laughs> but, you know, even, even though they sincerely wanted to help, the problem was because this was an entirely new concept, curing liver disease, we didn't know how long we needed to give the drug, right? Because it's a chronic disease. We didn't know how long a person needed to be treated. We didn't know how much drug we needed to give them. We didn't know what to look at to show that they didn't have liver disease anymore. Were we, were we going to take a biopsy every time we wanted to look at it? That seemed a little too much. So as we got into this, what we realized is that if we didn't guess right, the very first time we did our big <coughs> clinical study to show effectiveness, that we would have a problem. And that problem would be that we wouldn't get the statistical significance that the FDA wanted. We'd have to start over again, and once we did that, <coughs> our patent would be expired by the time we got the product to market. So the management decision was that we shouldn't go ahead. <coughs> and that, of course, is very disappointing. Now, we might be willing to pay more money and lose all this innovation if drugs were safer. But you know, as you might imagine, loss of innovation, which is so huge, we lose at least 50% of our innovation, probably closer to 80%. And just as people die waiting for new drugs, they die if the drug never gets to market. That would save their life. And about roughly four times as many people die from loss of innovation then die from the delays. So now we're starting to talk some pretty big numbers here. And for all of this loss of life, for all of these high prices at the pharmacy, we haven't gained a whole lot of safety because the withdrawal rate's about the same. Pre-amendment, we withdrew about two, two and a half percent of the drugs that made it to market because of safety reasons. Post-amendment, it was a little higher, 3.2 to 3.5 percent, depending on, you know, which time blocks you use. But it's really not that big of a difference. In fact, the difference, if anything, goes in the wrong direction. More drugs were withdrawn after the amendments. So it implies that drugs haven't had any safety improvement. And, you know, we talked about the big drug disasters, the Lidomai, 10,000 deformities. But Vioxx was approved by the FDA and caused somewhere between 88,000 and 250,000 heart attacks. So it was much, it was actually the, probably the biggest drug disaster in history. And that happened after the amendments were passed. <clears throat> and because today's drugs require patents, you know, when I started at the Upton Company, they didn't require patents, um, but a few years after I started, management said, no, no more drugs without patents because we can't afford the development costs. And you can see why, because they went up so hard, right? Um, and generally, they can't be natural products. You can patent a natural product, but mostly you have a situation where by the time someone wants to do something with that natural product, it's been out in the literature. And that's a bar to getting a patent. It can only be out there for so long before you can apply to it, apply for a patent. And today's drugs are so are not surprisingly, today's drugs are only developed if they expect people to take them for a lifetime. Why? Because they have such huge development costs, and only about three out of ten drugs actually recover the development costs. So you don't want to do anything but a blockbuster drug. You don't want to do anything but something people will have to take for a lifetime because you have no prayer of recovering your investment. 
And of course, the pharmaceutical companies today have to encourage doctors to take, give their patients multiple drugs because again, they're fighting this huge development cost and that's really bad. Because when you mix drugs, you have more side effects. <clears throat> okay, so, why am I talking about this? Because our next speaker is gonna tell you a possible solution to this problem. It's not a full solution, but it's a possible one. And I want to lay the groundwork for her talk. So, I feel that's very, very important. And as you might expect, um, as you might expect, the drug companies had to get out of the prevention business. Why? Because, really, they couldn't do what the FDA wanted under the amendments. Under the amendments, the FDA wants very expensive effectiveness studies. And to do all that development and pay those huge prices for development and then try to actually sell vitamins, it's very, very difficult because the prices are going to be low. Now, could they have done what supplement companies are doing today? Possibly, but the FDA does not like the way the supplement companies work, and they have done a lot of raids. I think there were 50 of them here in Texas alone during a three-year period. So, of course, the pharmaceutical companies were discouraged from doing that. And yet, as you've heard from John Mackey, uh, you know, there are real advantages to having natural products either in your diet or as supplements because it can prevent environmental damage that can cause cancer, heart disease, etc. And one of the most one of the most interesting uh, stories, I think, are the ones for folic acid, which is a B vitamin. We knew in the early 1980s it prevented certain birth defects like spina bifida. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they talked about this, they'd shut them down. Why? Because the effectiveness studies that the amendments required hadn't been done, at least not to the way the FDA wanted them. So it, it was published in the literature, but that doesn't count with the FDA. You have to do a study under its umbrella, or at least you did back then. So that didn't, uh, that didn't help. And, and as a consequence, it wasn't really until the 1900s, uh, I'm sorry, the 1990s that when the CDC made its recommendation that all women of childbearing potential take folic acid supplements, that young women began taking it. So probably there were about 20,000 to 25,000 children born with unnecessary spina bifida and other birth defects or were aborted because of this uh, basically 10 to 15 years when the American public didn't know that taking B vitamins would help prevent these birth defects. And of course, fish oil. Uh, fish oil is good for a lot of things. I really didn't have time to get into all the things it's wonderful for. It's so wonderful that one drug company says, we're gonna take this natural product through this horrible FDA process because then we can go to doctors and say, only our fish oil is FDA approved for lowering triglycerides, which is a risk factor in heart disease. So that's what they did. In fact, two companies did it. And yet, as we talked about earlier, Barry Sears has a pure fish oil, but if he went to doctors and told them that, uh, he would be uh, basically thrown in jail. That's against the law for him to go to doctors and tell them because he hasn't been through the FDA process. Now, the scariest one for me is the stem cell story. Stem cells are doing wonderful things, um, in, especially in orthopedic surgery where they're starting to replace parts of the knee and parts of the hip that weren't, that just weren't done in the past. You had to have surgery, you might have to have, for example, I had an ACL replacement, which is a tendon in your knee, and I had a, a cadaver replacement. In other words, I basically have a body part from a dead person, right? But stem cells have gotten so, um, stem cell technology has gotten so good that in some cases the ACL can be repaired with stem cells. Taken from your own body and given as a shot in your knee. 
Now, the FDA decided to get involved in this. And what was happening, there was a doctor in Colorado, Dr. Centeno, who was treating athletes of all kinds. He was on the cutting edge of all the stem cell therapy. And what he realized is, especially for elderly people, if your stem cells were taken out of you and injected in your knee, it might not be quite as good as if you had more stem cells. So he took them, he grew them up for about a week, and then he injected this much larger amount into the knee. Well, the FDA said that meant the stem cells were manipulated, therefore they were a drug, and therefore they had to go through the FDA process, which is, I mean, it's just almost impossible to really do a good job that way. So Centeno took that part of his practice offshore. If you can afford to go to the Caribbean, you can get the latest stem cell technology, but if you can't, you're stuck. But I'm, I'm suggesting that you may want to look at his website, which is right here. He has a newsletter that keeps you up to date with what's happening in stem cells. And it's especially good because right now there are a lot of practitioners out there that probably aren't doing it optimally. And he shows you how to distinguish. And eventually, I suspect all of us would want to at one time or another take advantage of stem cells. So I think that's a very important thing to be aware of. Now, I also, of course, I'm, I'm talking about nutrition and nutrients, and you're probably saying, okay, well, wait a minute, uh, how do I learn about this stuff? I'm not a scientist, there's lots going on, uh, I'm confused. Understandably so, it's a confusing subject. But I recommend you check out Life Extension, uh, because they actually do for you most of the work. They review the scientific data on nutrients for the layperson, and drugs too, by the way, on occasion. They have a protocol book, it's huge. It's online. Yeah, it's online. Uh -huh. For preventing and treating disease with nutrients. They sell supplements that actually have what's claimed on the bottle. Not all supplements do that. Um, they have high quality fish oil products and they actually put cofactors in there. So cofactors are additional molecules that help the fish oil work. And then they also, this is very important, I told you I promised you I would show you how to get low cost blood tests. And that's what they do. Oops, excuse me. Uh, so what they do is in the summer they have a half price set. And you can get a lot of tests that your doctor may not be able to order for you. Okay, so let's move on. Exercise is important too. If you think about it, um, what our ancestors used to do is run from the bear. And they'd run like crazy until they escaped. And then, ah, they'd rest again. So what, the, what that type of exercise did for them, it built up their lung capacity, which is supposed to be one of the best indicators of longevity. There's a workout based on this principle. It's called a, a HIT workout, which is High Intensity Interval Workout. Um, and I'm gonna put the website for that one too. This is Al Sears, and no relation as far as I know to Gary Sears. You can watch a free workout on YouTube too. Um, and that's important to keep up your cardiovascular strength. Um, now, of course, for your muscle strength, you might want a weight workout. I actually started a, a program, and I've, put the name of the program, the STS program, and the website where I got it, because I've lifted weights before, but when I did this program, I just started burning fat. I knew I was burning fat, because after I did the workout, I didn't care if I ate for hours and hours. In fact, I actually skipped dinner, which I never do, and made it through the morning. I had a 17-hour fast, which is one of the ways you can fast and get caloric restriction. But I was happy because I was burning fat. I lost three pounds a month without changing a thing, other than the fact that I probably didn't eat as much because I didn't need to. I was burning my fat. So I, I highly recommend that program. And then, of course, yoga, which there's so many variations. Keep your flexibility. That's another good thing. 
Okay, so the bottom line is our golden age of health that I talked about, that we were on the verge of in the 60s, has really been compromised by the amendments. There's fewer life-saving drugs, there's a longer wait for them. Technology is being driven offshore, obviously costs are up, and we've lost prevention because the pharmaceutical companies no longer can really get involved in that. And so that kind of concludes the prevention part of this. I want to talk a little bit, though, about how to find out if you have cancer lurking in your system. Because the bad news about cancer is that if you, if you detect it late and it's metastasized, it's really hard to recover from. And the reason I'm interested in this is my family gets cancer. 80% of my family members die of cancer on both sides of my maternal and paternal tree. So we have something that isn't quite right with our bodies. So what I did recently is I, about two years ago, I took the AMAS test. This is an antibody that is made by your body if it has cancer, really small amounts of cancer. In fact, it's so small that when this test came back positive for me, we couldn't find it. So the next thing I did was get the Enox test, and this one tells you where, where the primary site is, and it came back yes. So I knew I had breast cancer, but they couldn't find it with the imaging because it was so small. So of course I went on a bunch of alternative therapies, which I guess didn't work because it finally showed up on imaging. And luckily, I caught it so early that no problem. But if I hadn't known, you know, it could have shown up a lot later. And so if you have cancer in your family or, you, or you've had a lot of stress in your life because stress really exacerbates cancer, you might want to think about these tests. There's also, oh, I should mention your GP won't know anything about them. You'll have to educate them. Your oncologist might, but hey, you don't want to go, I mean, when you're talking to the oncologist, you already know that you have cancer, right? That, that you, don't, you don't see them unless you're already in treatment. You don't want to wait that long. You want to be proactive. There are other tests. The Nagalase test will detect cancer and viral infections. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's if you have a viral infection like HIV or a very infectious agent, it'll show positive. So I, I don't recommend this one necessarily, but I did have that as well. Um, and then your oncologist will, after you're treated, will want to look at circulating tumor cells, uh, which is looked at to see who needs aggressive treatment. So I hope that information is helpful. I hope it will save a life because I, I'm not sure I would have detected the cancer in time. It was only because we were aggressively looking that we found it. Okay, keeping stress down. I just met, got done mentioning that stress was a big component. You heard John Mackey say that's a big component in cancer too, actually in health, overall health. Just thought I'd mention a couple things. So meditation can be very helpful. It doesn't have to be linked to a spiritual practice. Uh, what meditation, there's many ways to do meditation, but what basically it does is it focuses on keeping your thoughts on one thing, which is really hard. <laughs> if, for example, you pick a mantra, what they call a mantra. It can be a one word mantra or a two word mantra, and your focus is just on having your thoughts only on that as you repeat it. Well, our minds are always chattering in the background. And if you try to sit with your eyes closed and focus just on your mantra, what you're going to find is that you go, for example, you might say, um, mantra, mantra. Oh, did I forget to shut the stove off before I started this? Mantra, mantra, and then another thought comes up. And you keep realizing all these thoughts are going on, and it's very distracting because our mind thinks that's what it does. So this helps you focus. And when you focus and there's no other chatter going on, there's nothing going on, you come to a place that's very peaceful. And that peace carries over into your day.
And if you're very fortunate, the peace actually turns into bliss. Because for some people, this is the first time their mind has slowed down enough for them to experience the peace. So it's, it's a very great thing. And then inquiry, oops, I'm sorry. Inquiry is another good thing to do if you feel like meditation isn't for you. What is inquiry? Well, there's many forms of it. I've put what I think is a good starting point. Um, you know, we're all conditioned by our parents and our society. And so we end up doing things, you know, we don't know why they do them. We do them. We're, you know, somebody, when, when somebody pushes your buttons, what they're doing is they're accessing your conditioning. And you get all worked up and you're going, wait a minute, why am I getting worked up over this? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes sense because you've been conditioned as a child for something that might not be appropriate for your adult life. And inquiry helps you find those places and um, really deal with them in a way that gets rid of them permanently. And then if you want to know how this happens, uh, I like the Enneagram work of Sandra Matri. Now, a lot of people do Enneagram work, um, and I haven't been impressed with anybody but her. You might find somebody better. The last thing I want to talk about is end-of-life choices. No matter how healthy you are, no matter how good your diet is, eventually, well, nothing's certain but death and taxes. I'm not so sure about the taxes, actually, as a libertarian, but right now, death is unavoidable. So it's all going to happen. It's going to happen to all of us. So let me tell you a little bit about my experience with that. So as I told you, my family members died of cancer. Uh, my sister Marty, who was younger than I, she was not 41 when she died. She had uh, duodenal cancer, which is very much like pancreatic cancer. And she told me, just before she went into surgery, for them to find out if she had cancer, she said, Mary, if, if this is cancer, I'm not going to suffer. I'm going to go to die with before cancer. Now, this is in the early 90s, and we were in Michigan, so that was a possibility. Now, I know there are a lot of people who would never make that choice, and I applaud them. That's fine. But what I noticed is that it's important to have that option, because our health care is rationed today. You heard that a little bit from John Mackey. I can tell you if you have a loved one who's in the hospital, you need to be there 24-7 because our health care is rationed, not because the doctors and nurses don't want to give everybody the same care, but because there's just too few of them. So the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And if you're not there for your loved one, a lot of bad things can happen. Not on purpose, but just because that's the way the system is. So that's one thing I learned from my sister's illness. But the other thing I learned is that she was, she was very upset that she thought she was going to have to suffer before Dr. Kevorkian would agree to take her. And so she wasn't eating because she had a tumor in her gut that was blocking uh, the ability of her food and water to go through her system. Yet, when Dr. Kevorkian promised that he would help her whenever she wanted, Things changed. Instead of vomiting up every meal we gave her, she began to eat again. And I realized that the tension and fear that people have when they're suffering with something like cancer is their fear is so great that they're going to have to have even more suffering that, in a sense, it makes the situation so much worse. So having that option can give somebody else that's on the edge a chance to recover. If my sister could have recovered, I think she would have. But unfortunately, a few weeks later, she was having the same problem. And this time, she did go to doctor before again. And that's sad in a lot of ways. But when she did that, I believe she saved other lives. How did she do that? Well, again, our healthcare system is rationed. So when she left early, the people who wanted to stay and fight it out to the end had more resources at their disposal. 
Of course, she's only one person, so that might have been small, but that might have been enough. Might have been enough to save other people. At least I like to think so. And certainly if this option was available more widespread, it could make a big difference in our healthcare system. I learned another thing with my sister, and that was there are some situations in which you know more than the doctors. Because just because you know your your sibling or your loved one. Uh, when Marty was operated on initially, she had what's called post-operative ileus. In other words, her guts stopped moving, and because of that, she couldn't take in any food. And this is this is a this was other than her tumor. This was a condition where your guts stopped moving. I mean, you die from that. So when I went to see her in the hospital, I noticed that she was a little hyper. <clears throat> Even though she didn't look hyper to other people who didn't know her, I could tell because I knew her. So I said, Marty, let's, let's try sitting and meditating and see if that won't relax your back. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, she was passing gas and she was moving her bowels and the post-operative ileus was over. This is something that any of you can do for your loved ones just by paying attention. And so I want to, again, encourage you, if you have a situation like that, to recognize the power that you have to help, you know, help get the best care for your loved one. Now, I want to point out that there is an organization that follows the status of end-of-life options and it's compassionandchoices.org. If you have a situation where you need that information, that's the place to go. Right now, there's only a couple states that allow that, but that's changing. I'd like to end uh, by inviting you to come to my website and check out uh, my books, especially Healing Our World. If you like some of the stuff, if you like some of the stuff that I talked about with the FDA or healthcare regulation, there's a couple chapters in Healing that deal with that. You can read the 1993 version online in my free library, or you can purchase the 2015 book that's shown here. And I'd like to end, and if somebody would tell me what the time is, I want to see how much time I have for questions. I should have had somebody time me. Okay, I only have a few minutes for questions, but I'm happy to take them. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can you comment on the, this is kind of the other side of the coin with regard to regulation. The, the, uh, apparently the manufacturers of vaccines have a special category in that's right. Can you comment about the effect that that has on that whole world? Yes, well, what was happening is the vaccine manufacturers were getting sued enough because it's a biological product. There's going to be a lot of allergic reactions <coughs> and others. And so they were getting sued so much. And the FDA was actually being very hard on vaccine manufacturing at that time. So they had the regulatory people on top of them and the legal people on top of them, and they just started stopping making vaccines. And so they put that legislation into place on the liability side to encourage the manufacturers to make vaccines. So now they really have, because they don't have the liability, they can, you know, they, they are able to keep coming out with more and more vaccines to give your children without worrying about having a problem with a the liability. They still have problems with regulations, but the FDA's backed off on that a little bit. If that answers your question. Yes, Chris. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, some ayahuasca ceremony is because it's a Native American medicine, they can get an exemption to say, oh, you're a Native American church. Do you think maybe we'll see more of this, or they're just saying, saying this? You say you're a church or a clergyman, that really takes a lot of the regulations out of play. You know, do you, do you, do you practice a psychotherapist or whatever? Yeah. Do you do well, for that? Yeah, the question was, because I know uh, sound isn't carrying too well, the question was, well, what about the people who are clergy people? Can they, you know, and they might want to claim an exemption to give 
substances that normally would be required to go through regulatory processes without having to bother with that? Do I see more of that? Well, actually, I, I think the trend is in the other direction, at least from what I've seen. And I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong. I, I don't see that. I don't see religious freedom trumping regulation very often. Yeah. Anyone else? I think I have probably time for just one more. Yes. That's right. Just go on, because doctors, you have to be a member to get most of their stuff. That one, you know. That's right. Life Extension's a great site. It's got, they put all their research out there. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Okay. I think my time is up, so I am going to uh, leave you at this point, and I'm going to get my notes so I can introduce to you the next speaker who's going to talk about the right to try. <laughs>